how do you build a place that people want to be at for as long as they want to work? That's really tough to do in our profession. All of architecture is a process that evolves and you learn from one project to the next. You are learning new stuff every day. I don't care if you've done it for three weeks or 35 years. The profession has a tendency to attract that kind of person that wants to leave a meaningful legacy. As a result of what we're doing, the world looks different. We got this physical thing that's gonna be there for decades, if not centuries, if you do it right. How do you grow cities intelligently and responsibly over time to create a nice place? An awful lot of people look at Portland for clues about the future. GBD's projects are definitely a big piece of that. The firm was founded on the concept of a partnership where the folks who were partners were equal in every respect. That culture has defined the way we work for, well, all 48, 49 years. Fred Ruda had been a, uh, a project manager at uh, Skid Maurice and Merrill. SOM was the training ground for every architectural firm in this town. He got, I think, a little bit tired of not just doing that sort of thing, and then he said that he wanted to form a new firm himself. There were three different qualities that he wanted to try to achieve. One was to do good work, the second was to make money, and the third was to have fun. In 69, we decided to make that complete move. And Burr Bontwell had really good contacts with some of the other large office users in downtown Portland. It started out as Rudat, Boutwell, and Partners. The reason that it was phrased that way was that only Fred and Burr were registered architects. We hadn't taken the exam, and so we couldn't have our name applied to the masthead, if you will. 1969 was not the greatest in terms of a business. The pickings were kind of lean. I think all of us lived off from our savings and insurance policies and sold our Volkswagens and whatever. Our first office was actually down in the Pearl District and it was the third floor of an old knitting mill. It was a totally bare space, so we had to do our own uh, painting and refinishing as best we could, and we made our own drafting furniture. No AC in there, so summers were tough. You had to keep your forearms off the drawings because you perspire and get them damp and wrinkled. As far as I understood, they never made any money by the time I came around. It took us a couple of years to even get beyond the first five starting partners. Alan Beard kept calling me and asking me to come to work at uh, what was GBD at the time. And so I came to my first interview and he stood me up and I said, I will never work for that man as long as I live. Eh, a month later, I started work here. Chuck Burr and myself, at least, had a relationship with Standard from SOM. They were willing to give us some of their smaller TI work. This big commission with Standard Insurance Company, uh, coupled with the fact that they were doing all of the non-bank planning for what was then the first National Bank Tower, they had two really big commissions that started giving them some money. This was kind of the Mad Men era, and every lunch was a two or three martini lunch. Every Friday, Fred would put a bottle of gin on the table, and there'd be a round of seven glasses, and people would sit around drinking plain gin with not even any ice in it. We were starting to grow, and much of it, I think, was due to the success that we had with 200 Market, because that was a it was kind of a landmark building for us to do in the early 70s. If you looked around, there were very few buildings of any even dark hue other than brick buildings. And this to be a totally black skyscraper, black glass, reflective. It took a while to get the, uh, the design review people to accept it. You either like it or you don't, you know. And, and so it had that sort of response. It is one of the most impeccably 
designed office buildings in the city of Portland, perfectly designed by old SOM standards. I had to walk the four sides of the building uh, when I did the initial punch list on the curtain wall, so I got to know the building pretty well. We were uh, included in a, a program at the Museum of Modern Art in an exhibition on glass in architecture. They all put on tuxedos and flew to New York and to be honored in an exhibit as a symbol of Portland architecture. Fred Rudat had retired out of the firm because he had some health issues. We then changed the name of the firm. Boutwell, Gordon, Beard, and Grimes. Six months before I started, the founding partner, Burr Boutwell, passed away. When Steve came on board, there was another fellow, Hal Bales. He was then part of the title. And it became kind of cumbersome, especially for the receptionist who had to say, good morning, GBGBD, can I help you every 15 seconds? Then I became a partner, and we decided that, well, just adding more names to this already lengthy list was not a good idea. You know, how in the world are people supposed to keep following somebody that changes their name every five years? We decided, as part of forming a corporation, to just shorten it to the acronym GBD, which included the initial of the last name of everybody who was a partner at the time. One of our most significant hires was a young woman named Beth Cowman. She was hired to begin interior design as an important aspect of GBD. When I first joined the firm, we worked on a lot of corporate office spaces, primarily did a lot of tenant improvement projects that were space planning projects. Worked with clients like Nike and Columbia Sportswear, and then I went on to become a senior associate and the first female principal in the firm. It was a time when we were growing as a firm and getting more recognition in the community and also in the Pacific Northwest. We had the opportunity to purchase the auditorium building down on 3rd and we went through the redesign and the historic documentation on that uh, which was a real challenge but we maintained that ownership into the late 80s. We didn't have computers to draw with at the time so everything was hand drawn. We did a lot of pencil drawing, pen and ink on mylar. It was considered a good day when you didn't spill your coffee on your drawings. Well, we found a formula, and the formula worked if we were about 30 to 35 people. I mean, we made a conscious decision to become, what, a 50 or 55 person firm. That was a milestone moment in saying, yeah, we could do this with more people. It'll be okay. One of the great things about this office location is the fact that we're immersed in work that uh, our office has produced. Everything you point to is work that GBD Architects has done. We're sitting in a project that I think was a watershed moment for our company. Not that we hadn't done buildings like this on an individual basis, but this is the first time we've ever been given the opportunity to do something as impactful as the Collective Brewery Blocks project. The Brewery Blocks said that there isn't just a downtown urban core anymore. There's this spot over here in this Pearl District that's really ready for our business community and for kind of up-and-comers and pioneering spirits that wanted a nicer lifestyle but they wanted to live urban. Growing up in this area, I wasn't allowed to cross over Burnside to come on this side of the street. It was really an area that at 5 o'clock went dark. The city was offering the property up to a developer. It was an interview process or kind of best offer process, but we ended up being selected and got to do the work with Gert and Elon. We had no clue about how important the project would ultimately become. That was a huge game changer for us, both in just the scope and the type of project, because it wasn't just one project, it was five blocks at once with an underground garage. Um, I think one of the more famous projects of ours is the Armory Theater. We were trying to shoot for lead platinum on that. It was on the National Register of Historic Buildings. It was an incredible challenge to get them to bend enough to allow us the flexibility to uh, change the use of that building. And the brewery blocks was a great first step in really learning how to bring complex building blocks together. Plenty of cities have buildings full of people, but they fail as good urban fabric because nobody concentrated on what the street was going to be like, what that experience for the pedestrian is going to be like. If you lose track of that, you can have a dead city very quickly. Now we really went in saying the space between the buildings is as important, if not more important, uh, than the buildings themselves. 
The one thing that I think we've really learned from brewery blocks is first of all, how to think through placemaking, how to really put that in the forefront of our design, but even more so how to always try to bring sustainability to the forefront and use it as a story to the project that we're doing. Everything was lined up perfectly to make this a success. And it was, it was a huge financial success, a huge architectural success, a huge urban planning success. I give tours to people all over the world of the Bury Blocks on a regular basis that want to come and see what we did here and how it was so successful. The Bury Blocks project has been hugely transformative for the firm and I think sort of shaped the way we take on projects and really look at ways of creating a place where people can live and work and play. It moved the downtown ground zero from the urban core to this part of town. It also set up not only the rest of the Pearl District's development, it clearly did, but it also signaled other areas like South Waterfront. I remember it when it was nothing but a dirt field, and now it's just a beautiful buildings and it's just transformed the skyline. South Waterfront, in my mind, would not have occurred if the brewery blocks hadn't said, Portland can do towers. People want to move into these towers. OHSU Center for Health and Healing was firstly platinum building that we had done in the office. That building became this kind of lifeblood down at South Waterfront. It was the yeah. first project down there. So Set the tone for the whole district. Yes. It seemed like that was a great opportunity to really display and showcase sustainable features. Well, oftentimes, the really neat energy efficiency strategies you just don't see. And the only way you would know is if you were the engineer down in the basement or up on the roof. You can't actually tell that you had an interesting way to generate electricity. Here we had foldable take panels on top of the sunshade, so not only were we blocking incoming solar heat gain, but we were also generating electricity with it. You can see the impact that they've had by creating this eco-district here. And then they took their learnings here and then they, we, you know, we went to Lloyd. I think the Hassel on 8th project over in the Lloyd District is a good example of trying to get sort of that 24-7 living situation, working situation to happen. It wasn't like that Lloyd Blocks area wasn't developed to a certain point, but I think injecting this small community has reactivated that area quite a bit. It was three buildings all at the same time, plus a large parking garage, but it was all sustainable. And it was, you know, triple lead platinum on the project. And I was going to retire when I was 58, and that project came along at, at 57, and I kind of went, well, yeah, I need to stick through with this. When you go to Haslow and 8th and you walk through the plaza, you see people hanging out there, and you see it's active and being used, and that it's got life, and it's having value for the, the people, the residents that live there. Before that was a surface parking lot and there was no one hanging out there. I think the NORM project that we did over at the Hassel and 8th has been amazing learning experience for us as far as understanding the reuse of water and how we can be better stewards. Treating all wastewater on site as opposed to tapping into the city system which is actually undersized and overflows into the Willamette River. So by keeping our stuff out of that pipe and treating it on site we're actually not polluting the river. I think it's the placemaking now is much a hallmark of what we do as anything. It's not just the architecture, it's more the overall urban fabric that we're trying to create. We approach buildings from a you know, human perspective. It's more of an attempt to be honest and authentic with the context that it's designed in. The opportunity with the multi-block development is that kind of chance to create critical mass and being able to create that 20 minute lifestyle within a single development. I can go over here and get dinner. I can jump on the train and get to work. When you're working on a lot of property next to each other, you get to really change the pedestrian experience. The first 35 feet of height above the sidewalk, that's everything. Is it invigorated with great retail? Does the housing come down to lower levels? Once you get 24-7 opportunity happening in a positive way in an area, it really improves the district. It's not about creating a monotonous solution, but creating something which looks like it was built by the hands of many. That kind of village approach, where a village has a lot of diversity and a kind of eclectic fabric to it. In other countries, their apartments are so small because the city is their living room. And I think that GBD really has taken that to heart in all of the urban planning that they've done is really thinking about how can we really make this a place that we've built for the people of Portland. Having a renaissance level impact on an area of a city 
that is kind of the holy grail of the profession. It's what Portland is really becoming very famous for, and that's why we're drawing people from all over the country, all over the world. I feel in a small way we've helped contribute to that. We know how to do this work, we're confident in it, we know that we can have successful projects built. And I think those sensitivities in a greater capacity have contributed not only to Portland, but also other cities that we work in, Los Angeles, Seattle. We've been to China, we've been to Columbia. Those jobs have all been associated with trying to educate the world about sustainability. Buildings last a long time, and it takes a lot of energy to create a building. And you better do a good job creating that building so that it's lasting and so that it makes good use of resources. When we first started, we were pretty proud to get Lead Silver. And you know, our most recent project was meeting Passive House, which is a really tough standard to meet. It's really kind of an innate part of what we did anyhow. We were doing semi-sustainable buildings even before LEED came along. We just completed our 50th LEED project. At the same time, we're going through our 50th year of existence, which is kind of an interesting kind of correlation to the reality of what GBD is about. I think from the beginning, we realized that attracting and retaining employees is a wise business model. If you pay attention to your people and create a place that they enjoy coming to work to every day, good things happen. There's a sense of equality among uh, everybody that works here. You're not at the bottom of the ladder, at the top of the ladder. We're just all on a ladder. <laughs> and the ladder tends to be very horizontal. 60 out of our 90 people are owners of this place. And that's a powerful, powerful tool for incentivizing someone to grow their career here. The leadership is here to serve, not to you know, have everyone else serve them. It's really a MO to give people space and open water to do things that might not be able to occur at many other firms. For that reason, you see a lot of people here that have worked many years at GBD. It's not just the architecture, it's the personal experiences. I like to think friends I've made at this firm are real friends, almost like family members. We all certainly like to go out and have drinks together and they can turn into actually big parties <laughs> rather spontaneously. There's a support system, there's a camaraderie, there's a respect for each other that goes beyond words. I spent my very first Thanksgiving here at a co-worker's house because they invited me and knew I didn't have any family here. As we evolved and we each got a little bit older, GBD became a place for our children and our grandchildren. We all have families outside of the GBD. We all are you know, raising kids outside of GBD. So Understanding how we affect the community and how we can improve the community is kind of just a part of who we are. You put your energy where you put your values. You work with people that are underprivileged. You go into communities where you can make a difference. A lot of people think community outreach is something they have to do. We come into it as in that we want to do it. Four times a year we take a day off and as a group we'd either do a community service project or a team building kind of project. We go out and we plant trees or we will pack food at the Oregon Food Bank, but we'll do something that in the same tangible way is making the community a little bit better. I don't know of many companies that take all of the employees and go and benefit some other organization. If you are extremely passionate about a cause or a project or some endeavor and can find a way to organize that and push it forward in a way that is in the best interest of the company, well, we support that. We have several people that have you know, pet projects like that that we encourage and we actually financially support. A lot of the schools are taking architecture out of their curriculum, so students are not getting that opportunity. The ACE mentorship program was something that I felt like was a way that we could still engage with high school students and that has just continued to flower and grow at GBD. It isn't any one thing that we do, but it's kind of a constant nurturing and level of care. Well, I think we always had the aspiration of the firm growing and I think its growth has really been due to the fact that we've had great relationships. I thought that uh, maybe if you had as many as 40 to 50 people, you know, that was a good sized office. But uh, to have uh, closer to 100, I think is incredible. I'm really proud of the care that we've been able to take of the company in terms of being handed this dynamic organization back in the early 80s by the founders and growing it to another level of competence and accomplishment. There are probably hours and hours of stories that could be told and they're all, a lot of them are, are fun and interesting, but I, I think, you know, what's, what's the next 50 years going to be like? 
When we look back on our era 50 years from now, I think we'll say that we're going through things that we were just on the cusp of learning. I'd say that we're still in pioneering mode. I think that's our biggest impact, is creating place, creating neighborhoods, putting things into the community that are meaningful. GBE's found itself in a really interesting position where, through its success, it can leverage better design. We have helped grow the population of this place. We have helped consolidate densities in downtown. And guess what? Social problems are now here that weren't there before. So our next <laughs> life as architects hopefully is going to give us a chance to help address those and bring what we do to help solving those as opposed to helping to create those. It's always exciting to see projects and get awards and, you know, get lead accreditation. But, you know, I think the people growing and coming into the next generation of GBD is uh, really the biggest highlight. I think it's safe to say the guards are changing and it's a new leadership. Why do some companies continue on through history being great firms, and why do others just kind of go gangbusters and then stop? GBD is set up to continue. We have fantastic history of great leaders who have handed the baton. The expectations and hopes, I think, are that this next group will take it to a completely different level of accomplishment and presence in perhaps not only our city, but maybe in the country. As far as our next 50 years, go find the youngest person in this office right now. They're gonna be a fantastic leader in this community. There's no question. I think that we have some good years ahead of us.